podcasting. Um, using podcasting, we achieved significant qualitative success in some terms of socio emotional and pedagogical enhancement. As a technological tool, the perceived evaluation uh, reflected that it was easily available, there was convenience of access. The students also thought that this extra effort of teachers is centered towards student and this therefore added that extra value to the teacher-student bonding. The student reflected that using podcast was a very, very effective way to interact with students beyond classrooms and also that podcasting had the potential of curriculum development in physical education. So from podcasting, we moved on to using another dimension, using the visual dimension in addition to the audio, audio dimension using audio visual media. What we did is we applied this idea, we explored the, the effectiveness of this idea on one of the modules, the rugby module, uh, which is one of the modules in the, in the uh, physical education curriculum in NIE. Now rugby by definition in a, is an invasive game. I invade into your territory and I score a goal. That's an invasive game. Other examples being soccer, basketball, hockey, and so on and so forth. So that's the big idea or big concept of the game. It's, it, it lies, it comes under the domain of invasive games. Uh, there are some important characteristics of this group of games. The players needs to constantly adapt to the opposition, to new and constantly changing play configurations, and to the circulation of the ball. And throughout the game, the players need to deal with complex environment that is constantly changing and attempting repeatedly to invade the opponent's territory to score. This is what is the core requirement of any invasive games. And when such a game is taught, or when such a game is required to be learnt, it demands uh, technical understanding, conceptual abilities, psychomotor understanding and abilities, tactical skills, cognition, uh, use of declarative knowledge in terms of knowing the rules and the goals of the game, use of procedural knowledge in terms of both cognitive as well as psychomotor aspects, which is a combination, and ultimately, if you can, develop some game sense out of it. So when we teach such a subject uh, or such a concept, these are all the expected learning outcomes. And we expect our students to grasp all of it and retain it in a two-hour lesson which is intense activity based, right? So we thought it might be a worthwhile idea to explore how much using audiovisual media based learning supplementation uh, effects or influences these expectations. So we delivered uh, this supplement over and above the usual pedagogical deliverables like lesson notes, lesson discussions, debriefings, and so on and so forth, okay. Uh, <clears throat> the question was, there are so many options now. I can just make videos and push it through iTunes. I could have used blogs and uploaded the videos and so on and so forth. So what we did, we selected YouTube. Although all of you must uh, definitely would agree with me that YouTube has been a platform for every possible human imagination, every possible human creativity. You think of an idea, key the word, the YouTube will show a relevant video, right? Uh, but our basis of selection was based on its popularity, its accessibility, the convenience of video upload and the convenience of access that it provides to us, the privacy option because we wanted this uh, as a part of the whole exercise and the fact that YouTube gave, us, YouTube gave us everything that was in line with the intended objectives of the study. So YouTube was our selected platform for the delivery of audiovisual media in uh, PE. What we did, we first video recorded the lessons Thereafter, we selected the relevant video clips. Thereafter, we prepared the text scripts which was relevant to those video clips. And finally, we prepared the audio files to go with each video clip. Yeah, yeah effort intensive. So, but overall, uh, our basis of creating this package was we wanted to reflect on those activities which were, which were realistically representative of what the lesson was intended for. We wanted to reflect those activities um, which, which constituted the pedagogical and the conceptual element of learning. The clips also had uh, individual performances and group performances. It also had critical incidents that happened in that particular lesson that would serve as a, as a, as a reminder or a memory recall. It also included 
the issues, questions, and the discussions that happen during the lesson. So all this was basically to give the students an element of deja vu of the lesson that they had already been through. OK, finally, when all the files, clips, everything was ready, we got it all together using a video editing software. We used the Sony Vegas uh, Movie Maker. Average duration of each video that we created for every lesson was about seven minutes, uh, ranging between five and 12 minutes from the shortest to the longest video. Once the video was created, we uploaded it on a private YouTube channel. Okay, now what's a private YouTube channel? Uh, let me finish this slide. And we did that within the same week of the lesson. And the moment the video was uploaded, an email and SMS alert was sent to the students that now it is up there, you guys can go and see it. Now I'm sure all of us have the idea what YouTube is. Uh, most of us, or probably all, also have a user account in the YouTube, right? Maybe I just move away from this presentation and uh, here you have a user account. I've already signed into that user account. If you have a Gmail account, it's the same user ID and password for a YouTube account, all right? So I'm into my private channel now. But before I uh, move further into this, I want to share with you guys a nice and intense rugby video clip. A half a minute, please have a look. That's clip number one. That's clip number two. And that's clip number three. Okay, wonderful. This is the pace or the intensity in most of our games-based lessons. Of course, this is at the highest level of performance in that sport, but our lessons are no less intense. Okay, if I may ask you, what did you see in those videos? The game of rugby. What was happening? Attack, wonderful. He's from PE, so he had that extra insight. Okay, uh, fair enough. What was the common element in all the three clips? Fair defense. <laughs> yeah. Scoring. Scoring, wonderful. Because when I play a game, I want to win it, right? I don't play the game just for fun. Well, I do, but ultimate goal is to win and go back feeling happy about it, okay? So scoring is a very, very important factor of every game that we play. But did you observe one common link in all the three forms of all the three clips. What was that one common link? Yeah, it's a team game, so it's definitely a team teamwork. But there was one common skill or technique which was strategically used. Coordination. Uh, yes, of course, coordination. Yeah, right. Passing. Okay, passing, passing. Yeah, what kind of passing? Yeah, a specific passing. <laughs> so the point is, when we as observers see a game, it is not really easy for us to pick out what was really happening. What is that particular concept which is the learning outcome of this activity, right? And when the students are doing this activity themselves, there is a high possibility that they might pick some, they might not pick some, all right? So what we did is, now have a look at this video that we created out of the lesson. LA drill, switch, scissors. Okay. This is the text that we create. We start the video with the conceptual explanation of what it was in the lesson. So this is called as LA drill. Scissors is a move where a player moves diagonally across, drawing his opposite defender, and then passing to his teammate, moving diagonally across in the okay. direction. So they read this. That's the demonstration. The player receives the ball, moves diagonally across, whilst his teammate moves in the other direction and makes the switch. Watch it in slow motion. Okay, so this is again to... The player runs straight first, changes direction abruptly, whilst his teammate cut across in the opposite direction, receives a pop pass in a change direction. Watch it again. When the pass is made, a dummy can also be made by the player with the ball. This also happened in the second clip. Watch the demo again. Okay. Switch move. 
So once the basic form of this activity is clear, they move into turning the technique into a skill that is using it against opposition. <coughs> so now there is opposition against them. They will use the same skill to break through or to penetrate through the opposition. Yeah. So this is a simplified form of what we just saw in the actual game. And they move on to using this skill in the actual game situation. He doesn't believe in passing, so it's okay. <clears throat> okay, there goes the diagonal pass, number one. Number two. Moving with the ball, passing at the right moment, one diagonal pass goes. Alright? So So that's what it was. So now if we again have a look at this video. Now you understand the importance of the diagonal passing as a tactics in attack. Right? There you go again. Fast burst, diagonal pass, breaking through the opponent. Alright? This has a couple of them. The first one, the second one, the third one, and scoring. Alright? So, that was the whole idea, creating different lessons with each lesson intended for a particular outcome. You learn the concept step by step from the simple uh, level to the abstract level and then relate it with the actual game situation, right? So that was the audio visual media for reinforcing uh, the learning outcomes. Who were our participants? They were the PGDE first year students. We had two groups, 18 each, the experiment and the control group. The experiment group, they had all subscribed to the Private Chair YouTube channel and only they were given access to look at the videos. The control group didn't have the access, but apart from that, everything else was the same. They were taught by the same lecturer with all other pedagogical de deliverables being absolutely the same. And they were also asked to refrain from sharing the videos with the control groups. Yeah, I mean, certain assumptions we had to make. This was one of them. The total duration of this exercise was 12 weeks, and the total number of clips that we uploaded was 13, an average of about one per week. Uh, so how did we, or did this effort have any effect or not? First mode of evaluation that we used was a tactical skills inventory for sports. This is already a pretty well established inventory and this is specific to the invasive games. What we did, we adapted a few questions suiting it to rugby and this content validity was established by two IRB or International Rugby Board coach educators that we had. Um, the questions were divided into three categories from pedagogical perspective, those which elicit cognitive abilities, those which reflect psychomotor abilities, and those which are a combination of both. The responses were on a six-point scale, from never to always, or from very poor to excellent. Say, for example, I'm quick at making decisions, never, maybe, sometimes, frequently, to always. Second example, my judgment of opponent's play is very poor, okay, bad, fair, to excellent. So those were the kind of simple responses that uh, they required to give us. 
what we did is we got students responses both experiment as well as control group responses at the start of the semester twice at start and end of week number one and at last uh, at the end of the 12th week so we had a pre with a repeat and a post then the second mode of evaluation in addition to this questionnaire was at the end of the 13th week or the module there was a IRB coach evaluation done by external examiners who came from the international rugby board so these examiners had no idea of no knowledge of student identity neither any idea that which group got exposure to the videos and which group doesn't and the third what we did is we <coughs> third tool that we used was that of a written assignment now this was examined by the module lecturer but when the assignments came to him he had no clue about who this assignment belongs to right because students submitted this assignment to a neutral faculty member who randomly mixed it and just gave code numbers to the assignment and handed it over to the module lecturer right so he had no clue about any form of student identity right so out of uh, of these three the first one was evaluating the cognitive and psychomotor learning and the game sense part of the whole story. The second one, that is the coach evaluation, was evaluating the game understanding and independent coaching abilities. And the third one was evaluating tactical situation learning and game-based learning. So all these three modes of evaluation were evaluating different dimensions of the learning outcomes. Uh, because we didn't know which one probably the uh, audiovisual media-based learning would impact. What we found? We found that in the tactical games inventory between the pre-1 and pre-2, that is the, the repeat uh, questionnaire at the beginning of it, there was a significant and high correlation between each group. One, since the questions were from three subscales, the cognitive, psychomotor and combined, we found a pretty high reliability coefficient for each subscale. That means the students responded almost similarly to the question belonging to one particular subscale, which reflected that yes, it belongs to the same category. When we analyzed the pre and the post scores, we did find that the pre scores were predictive of the post scores. But we also found that grouping did not significantly affect uh, any kind of predictability. So probably the audiovisual media uh, did not seem to have any significant effect on learning in both the groups. Well, fair enough, no problems. We had another one uh, in the back, IRB coach evaluation. We didn't find any significant difference. Written assignment, we didn't find any significant difference. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> so, although we did find that pre-test scores on the questionnaires did have some predictive value on the IRB coach evaluation, but grouping against did not um, affect the predictability. So again, probably there was nothing significant to report. In addition to these three tools of evaluation, we also did a survey with the experiment group of students. A survey having 22 questions on a five-point Likert scale. It was executed but done by a neutral faculty member. We briefed the student, took their consent that they can withdraw and the identity will not be disclosed. The survey findings. About 80% participants told us that in addition to this module, they are also receiving ICT-based learning from other modules. Now, this was a surprise because just two semesters back, when we did the podcasting study, 85% students told us that they are not receiving ICT support apart from this module from any other module. So probably over the years, the practice of ICT in PE teaching has really come up a long way, right? So this was the first uh, uh, good news to us. When asked about viewing the videos, 75% of them viewed the videos alone, 25% with a friend. Where? 75% home, 20% NIE, and 5% somewhere else. So it seems that home alone is the convenience factor for viewing the videos. When did they watch the videos? 65% watched within the same week that it was uploaded, and the remaining 35% during that particular weekend. How many did you watch? Well, 50% said we watched all of them. 28% said we watched most of them. And 22% said we watched about half of them. Okay, fair enough. But overall, if you see, this is a high level of engagement, right? Given the fact that each of them is a seven uh, minute video and you have to find time and uh, motivation, this definitely is a, a high level of engagement. Well, respecting privacy, did you share this video with anybody? 65% said, yeah, I mean, 65% <laughs> said, no, we didn't. 35% said, yes, we did some of them. Well, fair enough. 
Uh, how was YouTube? Well, 10% said excellent. It's a wonderful media to deliver the content. 70% said very good. 20% said good enough. So overall, I'll take it as it was quite nice. The quality of the audio and video, it was almost same as the media delivery. 10% excellent, 70% very good, 20% good enough. So YouTube probably does the trick. <coughs> right. When asked about the socio-emotional perspective, how did you like the videos? Irritating? Uh, okay, I didn't really think about it. Very exciting and worth looking forward to on a five-point scale. 60% said they were enjoyable and helpful, which was the fourth. And 40% said it was exciting and worth looking forward to. Content quality from awful to awesome. 5% said satisfactory, okay, okay. 45% said really interesting. 50% said awesome. All right. Was the material educationally helpful? 95% said yes, very much. 5% said yeah, helpful. When we asked these people, how do you think it was helpful? The most popular response was, it consolidated our knowledge and understanding. It was helpful in recap and revision of the lesson content. The second most popular response was, well, I can play, pause, play, pause, see it again and again, right? which cannot happen during the actual uh, lesson situation. A few felt it was a good teaching resource. And one pretty insightful comment that I thought worth sharing, it reinforces our learning during lesson. The tutor explains each activity in detail, including the reasoning. Right? So in, that, in a way, explains or supports what we initially intended for. Whether the video cards were representative of the actual lesson, 40% say absolutely, 60% say quite a bit. Did they have any pedagogical value? 55% great deal, 45% quite a bit. Whether the video cast contributed any extension of content sense or understanding, 45% great deal, 35% quite a bit, 10% somewhat. Okay. Did this help you guys as trainee PE teachers? 65% great deal, 30 quite a bit, 5 somewhat. How was your overall experience on a 10 point scale? 68% 10 points, 26% 9 points, and the remaining 8 points with a mean of 9.26. So it seems to be a very uh, encouraging overall experience. Would you like these things to have in future? 100% says yes, definitely. Why? Okay. Now, this why didn't have any categories of responses. We had a huge range of responses. A few of them I just uh, pinned down here. Useful and easily accessible platform. So it seems that the convenience of access seems to be a very important driving factor when we are trying to give our students ICT-based learning. It has to be conveniently accessed, whether it's downloading or viewing or pushing in or whatever it is. So convenience seems to be a very important driving factor. Number two helps in self-reflection because when I see myself performing in that lesson in the video, it, it gives me a lot of feedback on my own uh, learning. Extend the student's learning time. This is exactly what people told us in the podcast based. It's an ex excellent way to interact beyond the classrooms, right? And one, another very insightful comment, usually during actual lesson, you are playing and get tired, thus missing important points and instructions. These videos help reinforce the instructions as we watch them in the comfort of our free time. Now this uh, comment I thought uh, reflects quite a few number of things. One, in the comfort of our free time. Convenience is a very important factor that the students are looking forward to. Number one. Number two, uh, missing important points and instruction, therefore reinforcing of learning. Right. So probably the whole idea of ICT in view of the student revolves around reinforcement of learning and convenience of accessing that uh, ICT-based tool. Do the students think that is there any carryover of this learning from NI to the schools outside? 90% said yes, 10% said no. How yes? Well, useful for lesson planning. We can show the students how they performed. One said it was applicable for the IT generation of students. That means even our students are realizing as they go out to the school, it's a different generation of students who are waiting for them compared to the others that they have seen. But it is logistically challenging, which they understand. Student can improve their game by seeing video. It's a useful resource from a credible source. 
They found the videos to be short, apt, and effective, and uh, useful for improving their game sense. And it, they also commented that it allows every student to suit his style of learning and playing. There comes the individualized learning or diverse learning, and students can actually see it when they're asked to comment upon. Uh, of course, one student said, video or ICT is not a big part of PE, so it's not useful. Yeah, fair enough, it's okay. <clears throat> so, what do we conclude out of it? Uh, as far as use of audiovisual media in PE te teacher education is concerned, what our study showed, it did not reflect any significant learning enhancement when we used conventional methods of, of evaluation that we would have anyway otherwise used. All right? But from the response out of the survey, it seemed to be a huge qualitative success in terms of enhancing socio emotional and pedagogical aspects of learning. As an ICD tool, it was definitely providing convenience to the learners. It was providing them individualized learning experience, and they also agreed that this has a potential of peak curriculum development in the schools. So wonderful. That's as far as we could reach. So what? So what? And I had a huge stumbling block here. So what? Right? Went back to the basics, read up n number of research papers in this, and I found everybody is stumbling at this point. Everybody, not one paper I found could really kind of, you know, pave his way around this. Everybody had their own uh, uh, blocks of thinking at this point. So I thought, let's put it all together and see what we can synthesize out of it. Well, use of audiovisual media and PE teacher education did not reflect any significant learning using conventional methods of education. No problem. This is exactly what all the research that I have come through as far as ICT in PE is concerned have reported. Using the conventional methods of evaluation, they could not find any significant learning enhancement. Okay. And collectively, in this perspective, the research in the use of ICT in PE suggests that ICT should be used within the context of learning, number one. Number two, it should focus on improving students' understanding and enthusiasm. ICT is not a tool for learning, but a medium of delivering predetermined content. ICT allows teacher to explore different dimensions and liberates him from the constraints of classroom and traditional teaching strategies. So those were the words of wisdom that came up when I faced that stumbling block and uh, read up what other researchers also, also uh, were facing. In our study, when we evaluated the perceptions of student or the perceived evaluation uh, for the use of ICT, it seemed to be a, quite a successful effort. There was social, emotional and pedagogical enhancement. They thought that it was very convenient. It gave them individualized, diverse learning. They also felt there was a carryover to school. They can enhance the PE curriculum. Everything seems to be good. But more importantly, these points are exactly in agreement with other research. They've all found similar findings in their studies. And putting it all again together, ICT does not seem to be a mode of knowledge transfer. It is a means of knowledge construction. And there's a huge difference, and this is currently the, the core idea around which research in education with respect to use of ICT is revolving. And evaluation of ICT in teaching has provided us greater evidence of knowledge construction rather than evidence on knowledge transfer in the form of intended learning outcomes, which we didn't get. Currently, use of ICT is usually or mostly intended as an aid for knowledge transfer. Whereas, rather than to build up students' capabilities of cooperative and autonomous learning, which is the constructivist approach or student-centered approach. That is how it should be, but ironically, this is how it is currently. We're all using different ICD tools and to find out if, 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 if it, it did enhance learning outcome. And every time, we don't find anything very encouraging. But we do find other things which we are uh, taking as a byproduct of the whole effort. So, uh, trying to put it all together, integration of ICT in PE teaching and probably maybe in other subject teaching 
should promote and enhance learning by keeping in view, number one, convenience factor, the accessibility factor. Number two, to accommodate diverse learning with the students themselves reflect. Number three, uh, to bring about autonomous learning, which is the constructivist approach, that is, give the power of learning in the hand of the students. Make them capable, encourage them uh, to understand that they can actually access and knowledge and information from different sources. It is also to encourage cooperative learning in form of group work, sharing, assisting. ICT is a wonderful way to model different learning environment according to constructivist principles, certainly. It should be primarily used for motivating and enhancing the confidence level of the students that there are other learning environments in addition to the conventional and traditional classroom-based learning environments. The importance should be focusing on the learning process and not on the tool. And I thought it would be apt if I conclude with uh, this comment from one of the researchers in this area, that development of teacher knowledge is complex. And as such, there is a real need for teachers and teacher educators to focus attention on how ICT can promote and sustain teachers in becoming knowledgeable, capable, and confident in their professional practice. Only then can the practice of teachers be extended so that trainees have more opportunities to use ICT. Thank you. That's as far as I could have gone. How much time is taken to prepare a lesson <coughs> video? I mean, yeah. there are a number of resources used here. Uh, the person video, video taping it, mm. and then thereafter you edit. Yep. And you, as you said, you do the text. Yeah. Right. There was a learning curve. In fact, I was the one who yeah. took the video clips. I was the one who did the editing. I was the one who dealt with the software, almost everything. Uh, there was a huge learning curve, definitely, because it's a movie maker for professionals, not for, you know, P teachers. Uh, to start with, it took a long time. The first video took me about two days. For one class, one lesson. For le one lesson. And the last video took me uh, two hours. So. Once you get the hang of it, I think it's very fast. Uh, also, possibly the software was very straightforward. Pick up the clips, copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste, get them together, record the audio files, copy, paste, blend it, record, you're done. So from two days to two hours? Yes, yes, yeah. So um, there was certainly a learning curve. One same person who video and conduct the class can't be. Not possible. I think, it's, I think it's very difficult. So in a sense, you actually need, need an additional manpower-based help. Yes, certainly, certainly, certainly. Yeah. See, I'm just thinking, right, I mean, your conclusion is that uh, it's really not, I mean, traditional form of evaluation does not show any enhancement in learning. And the uh, conclusion is that, therefore, it's spent for knowledge construction and not transfer. Uh, but do we then train our our students or our training teachers in such a way that they they prefer to watch a video and attend a class. So in that, in that sense, I can have the video clips of the same skill done by a professional. All right, and then I say, okay, be class, go and watch a video. I don't conduct the class. So in that sense, that knowledge can be still gained by the students by watching the video. Uh, so therefore, we differentiate. <coughs> That therefore, is this a uh, enhancement of learning or a supplement of, of learning, or is this the learning that you want to get? And thereafter, you go into the field. Uh, so right. What, what do we want yeah, to yeah. It's okay. I mean, yeah, I agree with that. that. Training our students. Okay, we know that they are IT savvy. Okay, we want to meet them. At the same time, are we also training them not to listen to us during the class? But. After you can watch the video. Uh, true, but that would amount to virtual learning, right? Because I have no conclusive answers to that question, honestly. Yeah, yeah. And the it's current state of research also probably doesn't have. Uh, I mean, it is, it is only as much as we can deduce out of what we found and what we have read around us. Um, it seems, it seems that uh, ICT in teacher education, right? Uh, is likely to be more useful 
for uh, um, making our students believe that there are many different approaches to create different learning environments. Right? You can have a classroom-based learning environment. You can have a field-based learning environment. You can have ICT-based learning environment. There are many different approaches. You can have a web-based learning environment in the form of blogs and wikis. Um, so <clears throat> it seems where the current state of research is now, uh, if we have to conclude out of that, it seems this is probably most researchers are coming to an agreement that ICT in teacher education is more, uh, more an approach to enhance the motivation and confidence level of students in believing that possibilities exist in creating uh, different forms of learning environment so that students can be better engaged. We are in, in alignment with the existing trends uh, with respect to learning attitudes in, in use of IT, smartphones, iPads and stuff like that. And ICT doesn't <coughs> or may not be exactly uh, a discrete learning tool in itself. So that is where I could arrive at. I mean, it was a very troublesome situation yesterday and day before yesterday. Like, where I am? What do I share with you guys? I mean, there is nothing really clear cut that I can point at. But yeah, possibly this is how exactly it seems. Also, uh, as I said, I face the same block as what I found that other researchers are also facing. If we have to evaluate the effectiveness of IT in, in learning, whether in form of creating learning environment or in, in real learning, we have to, we have to think about, um, we have to think about coming up with tools of evaluation which are different from the conventional tools of evaluation. I don't know what those tools are, but it has to be different from the question answer or the written assignment or the coach evaluation kind of stuff. We have to come up with something which is more relevant, more connected, more in context with uh, this supplement of learning or this new learning environment that we have created. So a uh, lot more explorations definitely need to be done if we have to you know, point a finger as this is how ICT impacts learning. No, I was thinking how then should we use the ICT to make it more engaging to the students. So the reason why I asked the first question about resources needed, and then I, I, I also bring up the point, discussion point about uh, would it be, is it a replacement or is it an enhancement of the, the information that's being transferred or you would like to use the word constructed? Uh, Let's say if it's a professional done video, I can show the same thing in a better manner. Definitely possible, right? yes, Rather of course. Rather than videotaping the class and then right. showing it. But if the students is able to do something on their own, like for example, if it's easily videotaped by them using a, a handheld simple digital camera or even the, the iPhone, and then they are forming in groups and then they do something, at the same time they can do, upload it to the YouTube and, and review things and discuss things. Uh, there must be some objective there, of course. Then it is a different way of using the ICT. Because, well, okay. Uh, perhaps this is a project that's to show where, where the effectiveness in terms of enhancing learning. But I'm just saying that how then can it be better used by students to, to, to in a whole learning process? Yeah. Uh, would be that they are very engaged in it themselves uh, instead of the, the instructor being heavily creating that that, that we play but if the students play. tell me that we want to really do a small group work yeah. using our, I'm yeah. the happiest man yeah. because my, my, my aim is, my purpose is solved because I have given them an idea yeah. that this is a possibility and if they are willing to do it, yeah. well, nothing we like it. For discussion more that, <coughs> uh, I, mean, we, I, I know the institution is pushing for ICT, use of ICT for teaching and learning purposes. Now, if it creates a, a situation where uh, a lot of resources, time, human resources needed, uh, to create something that that may not be as efficient, not just effective, then we should ask the question, should we move in that direction? But if to create opportunities for students to learn, and they learn better with the use of ICT and being more engaged, yeah, then yes, we should. 
So just like in the new, in the age, in the early many many years ago, decades where computers start coming into the scene, a lot was just replicating what humans do, but in a computerized way, and then a human ended entering data and doing more pro processing work than the computer uh, is helping. So in the same way, I think the use of ICT in teaching uh, should be that. It should not be that the teacher is engaging in production work more than in teaching work. Right, right. Okay, this may, brings me to a, <clears throat> another focus of research in the current uh, trends now, the enablers and barriers to use of ICT in teacher education, right? Uh, so definitely there are, there are different factors that serve as enablers and there are different factors that serve as barriers to teaching, uh, to use of ICT in teacher education and I, uh, I have no doubts about uh, the fact that uh, budget, manpower and resources, right, yeah. they, they are more as of now, I won't exactly use the word barrier, but they definitely limit or restrict the use of uh, um, ICT based support in teacher education, which is definitely the case, yeah. So, can I add something? Yeah. Yes, yes, of course, of course, so of course, of course. Initial struggle. Yeah, yeah, that was the whole idea. The resource, and then you can reuse. No, the question is, is it worth it? Yeah, true. It's not that it's not used. <coughs> it can be used, but is it, can it be better utilized? Ah, huh, true, true, true. No, no, that is, I mean, true. I have a very uh, straightforward I'm answer. I'm the use of ICT just for discussion. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, it's a question of better utilization of resources and your own time. True, true, true. true. I have a very, yes, yeah, I, I absolutely agree and have a very straightforward answer to his, his concern. And uh, uh, it, is, it is quite clear in the uh, teaching and research world now that use of the learning tool is purely at the discretion of the teacher. Right? And that is, if you remember one slide, that use of ICT should be within the context of learning. Right? So in my kind of subject, if I think Video-based feedback is more appropriate, so be it. If, like the other module that I teach, exercise physiology, I use a blog, which I find to be more interactive platform compared to any other form of ICT, right? So the choice of using the means or the tool, I think it purely lies with the teacher. So uh, it, is, it is based on your, uh, um, on your approaches to teaching, it's based on the different learning outcomes that you are intending to be. It's based on the resources, their availability and limitations that you have. So the choice completely lies with the teacher. And I think the platform has been used differently by different lecturers. Yes, of course, of course, we of course. We had a, of course. a lecturer, Mark Wilkinson, who shared last year about how YouTube was used for his course. And students uploaded mm. their videos. Mm. And the others commented, critiqued, and how students improved on what they had done. So it, it was more on students doing the job more than the lecturer, more doing more of a facilitator's role. Yeah. The private channel, like in the, each one who have access, will subscribe to it. Yes. Uh, what? Yeah. Uh, what they have to do? They have to just open a YouTube account yeah. and pass me their user ID. I move go into my uh, account and enter the user ID. So when they want to access it, they can access it using their UID and password. They, they cannot download the videos, download no, because I had uh, restricted that uh, option. Uh, so, in the <coughs> uh, now it has gone up to fifty. Okay, so there's a limit to the number. Yeah, of now it's gone up to fifty. Up to fifty people but can but be of there. Of course, there are other ways of downloading. If the student knows how, you can actually download. Yeah. Oh, you can just see and video and finish. Yeah, there are yeah. ways. So, yeah, but the. Uh, but the uh, YouTube itself does have this option of preventing the download. Great. So, okay, no more questions. Okay. I hope I made some sense. <laughs> I don't know how much. But yeah, that's as far as. Oh, thanks. Thank thanks.